So what I'm talking about today is how to generate revenue with an ecosystem business model. As part of this, we'll be going through, I'll do a quick intro of myself, but we'll talk about what is an ecosystem business model, how it has an effect, how you can then join an ecosystem effectively. And then ultimately the main goal here is driving revenue then through that ecosystem and we'll wrap up. Just about me a little bit. I'm the founder and CEO of Partner Fleet. Uh, my background is I was employee number 10 at G2 in engineering, went from engineering to products to running partnerships um, at a company with 11 product lines. So I identified problems at both G2 and this other company, and that's ultimately why I founded Partner Fleet. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about Partner Fleet when it's more relevant to what I'm showing. Um, but I do want to preface that my type of webinar presentation is heavily story focused. I like to relate real world things to the ideas that I'm trying to convey. So kicking that off, I'm going to start with a story about the survivorship bias. And this will relate throughout the presentation in several different ways. So this goes back to World War II. A team of engineers was tasked with identifying a way to bring as many of their planes and pilots home as possible. And so what that engineering team did is they looked at all of the planes they had access to, they mapped out, and this is a representation of where all the bullet holes were. So being a plane, all the red dots are bullet holes. And so the engineering team went and what they presented was, hey, we should really put armor in all of these areas because that's where the planes are getting shot. That's where they're taking damage. So if we armor it up, they're gonna take less damage and more of them will return home. There were a couple people on the team who, who said, instead of doing that, what we've actually learned is that all of the places that are getting shot are the places that the plane can handle getting shot without crashing and without losing the pilot. If they get shot in the cockpit, the engines, that area on the tail, or a couple of those areas on the wings, the plane will not make it home. So instead, we should focus on armoring up all of those areas that we don't see bullet holes in. And that relates to what we're talking about because that's how we should really look at all the information we have in front of us as we look at our ecosystem, as we look at our product and our market, because we're only seeing the information that comes from sales or customer success. Maybe we're only seeing information from a subset of people when in reality, there's a much larger audience that we should be gathering information about. Very simple example of this. If you have 90% of your customers are Salesforce customers and you don't have an integration with Salesforce, you may not need to build an integration to Salesforce because your customers are already surviving without that, but you don't have a lot of HubSpot customers. And maybe if you want to open up that market, that's where you should spend your time. Um, again, I'll talk about this throughout, but I'm going to shift focus and talk a little bit more about what is an ecosystem business model and why it's important. According to Jay McBain, 76% of CEOs think their current business model will be unrecognizable in five years. This is actually from a couple years ago. So we're in the middle of this transformation now. And according to him, ecosystems are the number one reason why we're gonna see this change. And what does that mean? What is an ecosystem business model? Well, an ecosystem business model is a company-wide strategy that prioritizing, prioritizes generating value for customers through collaboration and partnerships. What that means is it's not just something that the partnership team does. It's not just something that the product team does. It's something that the entire company is responsible for. Ecosystem business model is also one of the few that helps your company move from a product to a platform. And so this is the idea that Salesforce did of they were just a product, then they had their app exchange, they became a platform. HubSpot did the same thing, AWS did the same thing. And even smaller companies are able to do the same thing through an ecosystem. But, oh, adding on to that, forgot we added this slide. Um, another way that this is phrased, and this is a new thing coined by Crossbeam, is ecosystem-led growth. And it's business that's driven from your partner ecosystem. And why this is important from a revenue perspective is 
generally ELG deals when done across the C-suite, across your sales, marketing, and partnership teams have the highest ACVs. They're more likely to close and they close faster, making them better revenue overall. But most people think of their ecosystem like this, right? You have your company in the middle, in this case, sales loft, surrounded by your tens, hundreds, thousands of partners. And that's how their, that's how your relationship works, is it's you and them, and you're the center of the world. In reality, that's not true. An ecosystem honestly looks a lot more like this, right? Slack being the key one here. Slack is working with Salesforce, Google, and ServiceNow, but Google and ServiceNow are working together. Salesforce and ServiceNow are working together. And so you're not the center of this ecosystem. You're just a part of it where all of these other players are also working with each other. Taking that one step further, this ecosystem didn't develop because Slack existed. It developed because customers existed. So customers define the ecosystem. It's based off of where they spend their time, who they're talking to, how they're influenced. If you're a sales tool, that's generally going to be very CRM heavy is where they're spending their time. But it also is defined by maybe it's the CSM at their existing tools recommending partners to fill a gap that they don't fill. Maybe it's coworkers, it's review sites like G2. Whatever it is, you need to understand where your customers are spending their time, and then you need to enter that ecosystem because you're not going to define it yourself initially. Even AWS entered the ecosystem, even though now they're considered a large gravity well in the ecosystem, they entered it where their customers were and got big enough to the point that they've started to create it themselves. So when we talk about that, that means that, you know, if you map out some ideal customers and you look at where they're spending their time, I've just small example here, you definitely should look at a lot more than just six customers um, or six ideal customers. But you'll notice that there's a lot of tools that were found here that are mapping out. Some of the customers are related to more than others. But jumping back to that survivorship bias, most companies, when they build something like this, it's only the companies who've submitted a lead to them, who've talked to their sales team. They're not looking beyond into those gaps to figure out where their market is actually gonna be most valuable. So I'm gonna, Talk about a real world story here. Again, like I said, I like to do stories. It makes it more relevant for me. So about 10 years ago, I was living in San Francisco area and I decided that I didn't wanna, I wanted to move away from San Francisco and I had a lot of requirements, right? I wanted to live in a small town with not a large school. So my kids could have a small school that they were going to, they weren't gonna graduate with 2000 other kids. Um, I wanted to live near family. I wanted to live near amenities like a movie theater, a mall, things like that. But I also wanted airports nearby. I wanted large urban centers nearby. And these were my requirements and what I wanted when I moved. Customers, prospects, when they're buying software, they have these same types of requirements. So if you look, this is where I live. Um, it's Bristol, you know, if you're just looking at this, you have no idea whether or not those other requirements are met. But as we zoom out, we went from, you know, the previous picture being roughly 5,000 people. Now we're a couple hundred thousand people. If you could see this, there is a Costco here. There is a, a movie theater there. There's a mall in the area nearby. So we're starting to get more of my requirements. As we continue to zoom out from where I am to where I to the larger community or ecosystem I'm a part of, you'll notice that I'm near Chicago and Milwaukee, which means there's two airports within an hour of me. There's two large urban centers within an hour, hour and a half of me. My family lives over in Janesville. They are within an hour of me as well. And so now even more of my requirements have been met. As I'm looking at this ecosystem, this community that I wanted to be a part of that met all of my needs, there were also some implicit requirements that I didn't say, that I didn't know. 
But one of those is I knew I was going to stay in the United States. I wasn't going to become an expat just because to me, that's what made most sense at the time. I also knew I wasn't going to go live on Mars. Maybe we're a few years away from that. Maybe that'll change in my lifetime. Who knows? But again, these are the implicit requirements that I had that I didn't need to communicate as I was doing my research. Customers are the same way. So when you're trying to figure out where they're spending their time, what ecosystem they're a part of, you need to understand those implicit requirements as well as those bigger requirements all the way down to where they are. And that's where you wanna enter the ecosystem. Again, they have their requirements. They're gonna communicate just a few of them with you. And then you need to dig deeper and deeper until you get to those implicit requirements to understand if you're doing the right things. So with that in mind, if we look back at this graphic, it would make a lot of sense here, the biggest area where you've got your biggest cluster, cluster of customers is going to be in CRM. So you're going to want to go find the Salesforce ecosystem, the HubSpot ecosystem, Pipedrive, whatever it is, and you're going to want to start communicating to people at that level about who you are and have partners who can talk about you. Enter the ecosystem, generate partners, generate mindshare in that space as much as you can. That doesn't mean you can't go after customer two and customer three, but those are gonna be harder direct sales motions, whereas customers one, four, five, and six are going to be partner-led or partner-influenced motions because you're in that ecosystem. Let's say you've already built out your CRM ecosystem, you're doing well, you're getting all of your customers that fit your profile of one, four, five, and six, but now you really want to build out your ecosystem for customer two and three. There's a couple different options of how you could do that. You'll notice that there's products that overlap there. And you just need to do that analysis to see what makes most sense to open up that new opportunity for you. But one of the key elements here is this is not something you do once. And that's your partner strategy for the next five years. Things change and things can change quickly. Um, as an example, I feel like up until 2015, I was only ever using Cisco Web WebEx. And I was rarely using Zoom, Teams, anything else. And then all of a sudden things shifted and I was doing a lot of Zoom. Then 2020 hits and I was doing only Zooms, it felt like. That same shift can happen in any of the ecosystems you're a part of, right? Snowflake was one of the fastest companies to get to a billion dollars in valuation. With, at their IPO and the biggest IPOs of the year when they did it, that if you had a five-year strategy built around data warehouses and you started day one, by five years, you'd be out of date because Snowflake came in and was so successful within that same time period. So you need to do this analysis on how you are going to approach your customers what partners are going to be most valuable for you. And you need to do it on a regular basis as the market continues to shift. And jumping back to the survivorship bias, you need to do it in a way that you're reaching out to more people than just the ones who submitted leads to you. You're not doing it. This is not a sales motion. This is purely discovery. This is something your marketing team does, your product team does. And as a partnership team, you need to be involved in that. I noticed a, a question in how do you build your ecosystem around the CRM space? So I will jump back to that a little bit. Um, ultimately, what you do there is you've identified that your customers are spending their most time in CRM. There's a couple different ways to start to build that into that ecosystem. And one of them is actual integrations. However, integrations don't always turn into customers. And there are customers who Maybe you don't need an integration into CRM. You're just using it to identify or for them to learn about you. So start with some partnerships in the space. Identify the ones who will actually be value add. Salesforce, while they're massive, isn't necessarily a value add because they're not necessarily going to talk about you. But maybe Pipedrive will or maybe Gold CRM will. Find the right ones with where your customers are and then also start talking about CRM. That's a marketing motion to talk about CRM and how you work in relation to CRM to help your customers out. 
So when we're talking about that whole business model and strategy around this, that's where you need to bring in marketing to have the conversation about the ecosystems you're trying to join. That's where you bring in product to explore uh, integrations with the companies there. And then partnerships is there to build the relationships with those companies as well. I'm going to talk about Partner Fleet a little bit here because it relates to everything we just talked about. So what we do at Partner Fleet is we are a partnership technology, meaning we sell to partnership teams. We help them launch their partner marketplaces. We've done this for companies like G2, Salesloft, and Showpad. And the idea behind it is think the Salesforce app exchange in a box. Um, we've productized that so any company can launch it really quickly. The reason that's relevant is our audience are partnership people. Um, these are people who are trying to grow their partner program, grow the number of partners they have, maybe grow the number of integrations they have. And that's where we fit in to help them accelerate that growth and do more. So early on at the company, I determined these are the three types of tools that we would, our customers are spending time on and where we need to sit in the middle. So the first thing I did was I went and talked to a bunch of iPass companies. I already knew them from previous roles. These are companies like Trey, like Syncery, like Middle, and Zapier. Talked to them, started to try and build relationships with them where it made sense for us to become have a partnership, even though there's no integration, and start talking about customers together. All of a sudden, customers of theirs could potentially start hearing about us because we were doing marketing around iPass. Very limited, but we were doing it. Those iPass companies would talk about us occasionally. Well, then we moved into account mapping. Again, partnership people, they a majority of them at this point use Crossbeam or Reveal. And so we started having conversations with Crossbeam and Reveal. And we started a partnership there, building on integrations and all of that. And so now, again, we identified three areas our customers spent them their time, and we started to work into two of those through direct partnerships, through co-marketing initiatives, through co-sell when applicable. Well, then we went to the PRM space and did the same thing. And this is just the same play over and over and over again for us to unlock new customer opportunity. So PRMs being like Partner Stack, ImPartner, Magentrix, Salesforce PRM. And we started conversations with them very early at our company when I knew we weren't gonna actually be bringing them value so that as we continue to grow, their interest in us has already peaked. They're already talking to us and it's been very successful for us. And so we took the same play we did and just dropped it in to these different areas, these different smaller ecosystems so that we can start surrounding where our customers live. And this has helped us be very successful. At this point, I believe it's something like 60% of our deals are partner influenced or community influenced in one way or another. So how do you drive revenue with all of that? Again, just a quick visual reminder of what an ecosystem looks like, right? It's not just you and Google, you and Salesforce, but they're all connected to each other. So if you're not a good part of their ecosystem, they're not going to become a good part of your ecosystem. It's no longer just a one-way street. There is reciprocity expected. But there's also different types of partnerships. There are partnerships that benefit the product team because it helps them go after new markets. It helps them identify gaps in their own product and solve that through a relationship with another company instead of making the engineering team build everything. The product team and the engineering team, the product no longer has to do everything for everyone. It has to do the core things perfectly or as good as possible. And then those secondary things partners can do. It benefits customer success because customer success is able to find a customer who has problems unrelated to your product and solve them through the relationships that the part partnership team has brought in, solve those gaps. Maybe it's SEO needs and you're a marketing automation tool. That's a relationship that makes a ton of sense. Or maybe it's setting up deal reg and you're on the, the sales team. Whatever it is, it makes sense for customer success to be able to go to those partners and bring them in to drive value for your customers. 
And all of that turns around to driving more revenue for sales, more prospects, more intros, more deals that are going to come to them. What that looks like in the real world is you've got your traditional channel. These are your partner sourced deals. These are going to be the ones that are resellers. They're either selling it and servicing it themselves, or they're selling it and um, you know the customer doesn't even know that you are part of what they're selling. That could be OEM. These are your referral partners who are bringing you leads and you know trying to generate revenue off of those leads that they're sending you. And then the affiliates, which are helping get your name out there to as many prospects and customers as possible. But there's also another large portion of the ecosystem that's incredibly important, and that's everything that comes in after a sale. And that's technology partners, that's integrations, that's a core competency that customers need to have is that you integrate with their existing tech stack. These are implementation partners who drive more value for your customers because they help drive adoption. And things like agencies or SIs or MSPs that provide value to your customers and your product, they'll get more value out of your product in coordination with one of those. This is very important because the customer lifecycle, those channel partners that I talked about, generally are only affecting that first 10% of your relationship with a customer. Let's say you've, on average your customer is with you for three years, your sales cycle, is somewhere around three months. Those resellers, refer referrals, affiliates, influencers, they're helping you bring those sales to the door, but they're not helping you renew the customer. They're not helping you retain the customer. So how do you take that customer from being a three-year average to being a five-year average? Well, that's where those other ecosystem partners come into play. Your integration partners, your ISVs, your agencies, your implementation partners. And this is super important because this isn't one-time revenue, right? It, I've seen dozens, if not hundreds of times where companies talk about the fact that because of their integration with company A and company B, they now have a solution that implementation partners are selling and SIs are selling to, their, to new customers as a whole. So they're generating new revenue that way. Or company like Drift is always promoting sales loft because their customers who use the sales loft integration are more likely to renew at 5X than what the customers who don't use the sales loft integration are. And so then all of a sudden, all of these partners that are helping with the customer lifecycle post-sales are now generating revenue. They're generating referrals. They're increasing the, like, the lifetime value of a customer. And this is where, talk about that give get. You do have to give them something. They have to see value of working with you that's not just single one-time payments, but long-term value. Which leads to a large revenue impact. Um, partner sourced, the, this leads to more partner source leads and deals. It leads towards more partner influence revenue that comes from those technology partners, implementation partners, whatever it is, but also will help reduce churn of customers because they're utilizing integrations. It'll reduce development costs for your product team because they're able to potentially enter a new market or expand an existing market, solve a large gap through a partner instead of spending 18 months to two years developing it, developing it in-house, which increases time to market for any new areas that they're focusing on. It'll reduce customer support hours because customers are getting more value through implementation partners, agency partners, MSPs, and it'll provide access to new markets. Very explicit example of that is a company I've talked to. They are helping generate leads for sales, but their tool actually would work really well for recruiters to identify new prospects, prospective employees, and then connect with those employees, send emails to them, whatever it is. Very similar process between BDR and recruiters. Well, they're going to open up the entire recruiting market by building a handful of integrations to HRIS systems, which is going to drive those HRIS systems to push people to them because it solves a problem that they don't. And so they are entering that market 
purely through partners and driving a brand new almost product line forward that way. And direct examples of this, real world examples, um, Bongiorno sees a 15% lift when at least one integration is used. Intercom sees a significant increase in revenue per account and retention when people are using multiple integrations. And we even have Rollworks who has identified here that customers using one integration are more likely to renew, but customers using four or more are 135% more likely to renew than a customer who just uses one. So they've figured out exactly where they need to be and how they need to drive customers to adopt these additional ecosystem partners for Rollworks to make as much money per customer as possible. That went a little quicker than I was planning, so there will be plenty of time for questions here, but as a quick wrap up, your customers define the ecosystem. So really you have to figure out the best play to enter that ecosystem. And that's gonna be through talking to prospective customers, not the ones who submit leads, but go find them out in the wild. That's trade shows, that's events, that's wherever you can. That's even people who are closed lost. Go talk to them and understand why they, you weren't a fit for them. See if there's something in the ecosystem you're missing to really create that connection that will next time they'll submit the lead instead of just reading your website and bouncing. The easiest access to brand new markets is through the ecosystem. If you identify partners, if you identify influencers in that space, that's gonna help you move into that new market fastest because you're not starting at zero, you're actually starting at 50 um, as an example. And that was the example I was talking about to an extent earlier with going and doing the same playbook in IPASS that we did in PRM. And then partner sourced and influence revenue is better. I feel like we all know this. I feel like this is pounded in our brains at every single one of these masterminds, but it continues to be true. And I'm starting to see a big shift where companies that are moving away from a direct sales BDR motion, but to a partner BDR motion, are starting to see their, this market that we're all struggling in uh, turn around for them, including ourselves. And then the ecosystem itself generates revenue through the entire customer life cycle. So instead of just that initial sale and potential renewals, you're getting those initial sales, but you're also generating revenue through upsells, through add-ons, they're more likely to purchase those if they're getting value from integration partners, implementation partners, whatever it is, and they're gonna spend more time as a customer of yours. And so that's where bringing that ecosystem into the full view and not just the pre-sales type partners becomes driving, drives all that revenue and drives significantly more revenue long-term. I appreciate everyone who sat through all of that. Um, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn, email me. Um, we do have some extra time here. Happy to answer any questions as they come through chat or QA. Um, I do see one that came through from Matthew um, asking, you know, this requires a robust R, uh, PRM platform to support various channels, asking for some recommendations. Um, the first thing I'll throw out is PRMs are a scale factor. And so it's really valuable once you know how the play works, then a PRM becomes really valuable. PRMs are as valuable as you implement them. Same exact way as CRMs are. That being said, I've heard really good things and seen success. I personally used PartnerStack at a previous company. Um, I've also seen and heard really good things about InPartner. Um, and it's just dependent on scale, what becomes the most important thing for your team. And even at a smaller scale, I've heard really good things about Partner Portal. Partner portal. Um, another one from Lauren is, how would you deal with partners with feature overlap um, and making sure that you're not kind of hurting your own business? In my experience, so I, there's a 
a term I've heard called co-opetition. In many cases, it's best to be best at what you're best at. Don't try to be best at everything. If your partner is better at you at your core competencies, you don't want them to be your partner. But there's many cases, and I've done this many, many times, where they're better than me at a handful of things, but I'm better than them at the core competencies. And so I spend, I, I do work with them, we create that, but there is a little bit more challenge when bringing co-sale opportunities together. So that's generally just more of an integration partnership in my experience. Um, but it does lead to an opportunity. I worked, the company I worked for running tech partnerships was m &A. So if you don't ever talk to them, you do lose out on opportunity for future acquisitions, I think I'll pause there. First steps of building a service partner program. Honestly, my experience with that has been find your customers, figure out what service partners they're using and talk to all of them. Those service partners already have a relationship with your product most likely. Um, that would be the first step is just identifying is there really an opportunity there? And then there's a lot of um, a lot of work once you identify that opportunity to build how you're going to bring those service partners up into sales negotiation, sales conversations, and depending on the type of service they're offering as well. Um, that could be a really big deep dive, Lauren. I'd be happy to jump on a call and just kind of talk you through my experience with that one-on-one -on -one at any point in the future as well. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for your time. Again, feel free to reach out and. Um, have a good rest of your day and good weekend. Mm -hmm.